Mike. At least according to my clock, it's 7.01. So good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Callanan. I am town council for the town of Brookline. And I will be your host this evening for a presentation on fair housing laws and their impact on local zoning. Staff from the state attorney general's office will be our main speakers tonight. This presentation is being recorded for later playback by those of us, for those who are in, unable to join us this evening. We expect the presentation to be about one hour. The first half to two thirds of the hour will be a presentation by Attorney General's Office staff. We'll reserve the remaining, remaining time for questions from participants. If you have a question, we would ask you to please place the question in the Zoom Q&A window where uh, when we have time at the end of the presentation, I'll be able to ask those uh, presenters the questions that the participants posed over the previous portion of the hour. If you post a question, but we do not have time to answer your question this evening, Town Council staff will try to respond to those questions in writing later. We will post those questions and we'll post those answers to those unanswered questions in the town's usual community outreach methods, including the town's social media, um, website, and the TMA listener. You can also send me an email at jcallanian at brookline, uh, uh, brooklinema.gov, J-C-A-L-L-A-N-A-N -A -A at brooklinema.gov. I'll put my email address in the window. Um, but I hope per tonight's presentation will be the beginning of other presentations by Town Council's office on various issues of law that might be of interest to Brookline residents. Uh, our bylaws require this office to provide training on legal issues such as ethics, conflict of interest, and the open meeting law for new town meeting members, but also new appointees to boards and commissions. We hosted these trainings last year, and uh, we're planning to do so again this summer for new members. But I wanted to expand the topics that Town Council's Office presents to the Brookline community as part of the Town Council's Office Community Engagement Goals. So before I could get that initiative up and running, I was asked by Town Council, I'm sorry, Town Administrator Chaz Carey and his office to host this evening's presentation uh, and facilitate the discussion, which I happily accepted. So if you know of other topics we would like the uh, Town Council's Office to present on or to find speakers to present on, please send me an email. Thus, to summarize, if you have questions for the speakers this evening, please post your questions in the Zoom's Q&A function. However, if you have a question for me later or the topic you'd like us to present in the future, please send me an email. Again, I'll post that in the Zoom chat. Um, some of you may know that I worked for, the, uh, for 11 years in the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office before I transitioned to municipal law in 2016, where I began work in another community before joining the town of Brookline last year. When I worked in the Attorney General's Office, I would frequently collaborate with Margaret Hurley as Director of the Municipal Law Unit in the Office of the Attorney General. The cases I frequently handled in the AG's office included defending the state's interest in public land. Occasionally, I'd have to work with municipal, municipalities defending the public's right to locally controlled land. So I often needed to work with Margaret on cases where I was representing the state, and I needed to work with Municipal Council on defending um, the claims that they had and the state also had. I won't admit how many years that Margaret and I have known each other, uh, but it's a big number. Mm -hmm. uh, now that I work for the town of Brookline, I'm once again working with Margaret as she and her office review the bylaws that town meeting passes. And we received an inquiry from her office today that we responded to. So uh, Margaret and I uh, again work together, even if I'm not working in the same office as, as her. So Margaret J. Hurley serves as the chief of the Attorney General uh, Attorney General Andrea Campbell's Central Mass Division in the city of Worcester. Ms. Hurley is also the director of the Municipal Law Unit, which is charged with review and approval of all town bylaws and all municipal charters. Before joining the Attorney General's office, Ms. Hurley worked in private practice in the firms of Myrick O'Connell in Worcester and Morrison Mahoney and Miller in Boston. While in private practice, Ms. Hurley focused on civil litigation in state and federal court and represented various cities and towns as special litigation counsel. Ms. Hurley is an active member and in numerous leadership positions of several bar associations, including the Massachusetts Bar Foundation Board of Trustees, the Massachusetts IALTA Interest in Lawyers Trust Accounts Committee, which is a committee uh, that distributes um, money to various legal uh, aid uh, associations, legal, legal aid uh, organizations, she also served as a president of the Worcester County Bar Association. She is a long-term member of the executive committee of the Massachusetts Municipal Lawyers Association, and she is co-chair of the public law section of the Massachusetts Bar Association. 
She's a hearing committee member of the Board of Bar Overseers and twice served on the merit selection panels for the selection of United States District Court magistrates and judges. Ms. Hurley is a double eagle and being a graduate of Boston College and Boston College Law School. She is a resident of Grafton, where she has served on the planning board and town administrator steering committee. Ms. Hurley will speak first and then introduce tonight's principal speaker, John Burke, who is the Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. The division enforces the Massachusetts uh, uh, civil rights and federal uh, anti-discrimination laws. John works on investigation and enforcement actions that address unlawful discrimination conduct, um, discriminatory conduct, unlawful discriminatory conduct in housing, education, and the provision of government services, among other areas. Prior to joining the Attorney General's office, John worked as a legal aid attorney in New York and Massachusetts. Margaret and John, on behalf of the town of Brookline, thank you very much for coming this evening and sharing your expertise with us. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to Margaret to get us going this evening. Thank you very much, Joe. It's really nice to be here and work with the, the team. Um, John is the expert tonight, um, so I will shortly turn it over to him. But I just wanted to quickly um, say how much I enjoy working with Joe, as you're very fortunate to have him as your town council. He's always very responsive to my questions and, and others as well. We, um, for many years, uh, were working together as members of the City Solicitor Town Council Association, now the Mass Municipal Lawyers Association. So he always lends his expertise to his colleagues in that role, and I really appreciate that. Um, for those of you who might not know, um, we we always enjoy getting the Brookline bylaw filings every every town meeting season. Um, there's always interesting and creative and innovative matters that you folks are working on. So um, we uh, we always uh, treat them very seriously and um, give them full attention. Um, but you're one of many towns across the state that we. Um, we deal with in the municipal law unit. Uh, if any of you ever have any questions about what we do or any bylaws or other town meeting issues or charters, we also review and approve all city and town charters. You can feel free to contact me by email and I'll have, um, I'll ask Joe to add our email addresses to the, to the chat as well. So um, always available to you if you have any questions and very thankful that I can present John Burke tonight to deliver the, the most important con content, which is the Fair Housing Act requirements. Um, I did want to note that um, John is very helpful to us as well in our review of bylaws if they, um, if they intersect with Fair Housing Act issues. We call on John um, to provide his input um, and uh, we try to assist him in his enforcement work as well, um, if he has uh, reason to investigate or bring any cases against municipalities. Um, so while the municipal law unit is not an enforcement division within the office of the attorney general, we try to assist where needed, um, John and other enforcement um, divisions in the office as well. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to John if you're, uh, if you're ready to present the content this evening. Thank you very much. I definitely am. And I apologize. My camera just started malfunctioning on my laptop. So we're going to give it a second here to see if it adjusts. And if not, I will go back to a, a blank screen. Uh, and apologies about that. So again, I'm a an assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division. Uh, the division enforces the state's anti-discrimination and civil rights laws, and that includes uh, laws that prohibit discrimination in local land use decisions, that's zoning and permitting. And I think the, the big uh, takeaway that, that we want everyone to come away with tonight is just that fair housing laws do in fact apply with full force to local land use decisions, uh, to zoning and permitting decisions. Um, and just like landlords cannot discriminate against uh, tenants and they can't discriminate in how they treat tenants, um, local 
local government, towns and cities uh, can't discriminate when they make uh, land use decisions. So when we're talking about fair housing laws, um, we are talking about a collection of federal and state laws that broadly prohibit, prohibit discrimination in, based on race, color, religion, national origin, uh, familial status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and other protected characteristics in the housing context. Um, and what does it mean to prohibit discrimination when we're talking about zoning and other land use dis decisions? Um, some of that is fairly obvious and we'll go over it in more detail in a minute. Some of it is more complicated, uh, but very broadly speaking, uh, what we're talking about is um, the laws prohibit towns and cities uh, from enacting or enforcing laws and rules in a way that has either a purpose, the purpose or the effect um, of unfairly limiting access to housing for people based on their protected characteristics. Um, and that phrase purpose or effect is, is very important um, because when we talk about discrimination under fair housing laws, we're actually talking about several different types of conduct. Um, the first type is what courts and lawyers generally call disparate impact, or I apologize, disparate treatment. Um, and that's closest to the sort of type of intentional discrimination uh, that I think most people think about when they think about discrimination. So when we're talking about dis disparate treatment, um, we're talking about two types of laws that are gonna cause problems, two types of decision-making that are gonna cause problems. Uh, the first is laws and rules that are discriminatory on their face. So rules that treat different classes of people differently because of their characteristics. Um, we see that most frequently with disability. Now um, we see, still see rules and regulations uh, that treat, for example, group homes uh, differently or unfavorably from other types of housing. Um, we're also talking about laws and rules that were enacted or in being enforced for a discriminatory purpose. Um, and so an example there would be zoning or permitting decisions that uh, are made for the purpose of trying to exclude families with children, for example. Um, and just a, a note on that real quick. Um, we see a lot of towns, not a lot, but we frequently see towns and cities uh, running into problems with, and I'm going to click off the video here because the camera is getting worse. Uh, and again, I apologize about that. Uh, we frequently see towns and cities getting into trouble uh, with um, discrimination based on familial status in a way that we don't with other protected characteristics. And I think part of that is at this point, I think most people understand and accept uh, that it's not lawful uh, to make decisions uh, and try to exclude people based on race or religion or, or some of those other protected characteristics. Um, not that it doesn't still happen, uh, but I, I think it's a, a more broadly understood prohibition. Um, the similar rules apply to uh, decisions that are based uh, or target people um, based on families with children. Um, and the, the same sorts of rules and exclusions that apply to decision-making based on race or national origin also apply to decisions that are made uh, and that have an adverse impact on people uh, because they have children or because of their familial status. So moving on from intentional discrimination, uh, the second type of discrimination we're talking about here is what's called disparate impact. And there we're talking less about actions that are motivated by or intended to have a discriminatory outcome. And we're talking more about things that are neutral on their face, but have a disproportionate or unfair impact on a group because of their protected characteristics. Um, and so again, th this is less to do with intentional discrimination and more to do with decisions that might have been made for non-discriminatory reasons, but the way that they play out has a discriminatory impact on people. 
So a couple examples there would be, you know, a refusal to rezone an area to permit higher density multifamily housing uh, if that decision has a disproportionate negative impact on minority home buyers. Okay. Uh, another example would be ordinances that restrict occupancy in single family housing areas using restrictive definitions of family. Right. So in both of those situations, these are both recent types of cases that get brought. Uh, the decision making wasn't necessarily intended to be discriminatory. That's not what the town or the city set out to do. But the way that things played out, uh, those decisions had that sort of unfair discriminatory impact on a protected class. And that potentially runs afoul of fair housing laws. The third type of discrimination that we're talking about, which relates to the other two and sort of overlaps with them, are just discriminatory statements of opposition. Um, so what we're talking about there are uh, statements either by elected government officials or in some circumstances by members of the public uh, that they don't want the town to take a certain action because of the impact that it's going to have on a protected class. So opposition to rezoning based on race, opposition to rezoning uh, based on uh, disability, uh, concerns about the type of people that are gonna move into a local area, all those sorts of things is what we're talking about here. And so state law, has some prohibitions that make these types of discriminatory statements uh, unlawful in and of themselves if they interfere with people's per, uh, fair housing rights. Um, it is also unlawful if a government actor acquiesces to public opposition that is discriminatory in purpose or intent. So that means that even if a town, a, if, if a town adopts a zoning ordinance, or another land use regulation, if the actual town officials that are voting on it or enacting it are acting because of public opposition that is discriminatory in nature, that discriminatory intent, that discriminatory purpose from the public gets attributed to the town and the city. It can run afoul of um, the fair housing laws there as well. And then from there, we have other types of discrimination uh, that are focused primarily on people with disability. Um, and so what we're talking about here is failure to make reasonable accommodations. And what that means is that if a town or a city has permitting rules or other land use regulations uh, that are perfectly fine on their face and in normal circumstances are non-discriminatory, um, but if it, they refuse to make changes to those regulations uh, or land use uh, permitting uh, rules um, in order to provide people with disabilities an equal opportunity to have access to housing that can cause uh, a separate problem there. Um, so again, I, I think the big takeaway that, that we always hope that people have is, is just in the first instance that these fair housing laws do apply to local land use decisions. Um, and um, both for members of the public and for planners and for government officials, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are sort of guardrails up, that there are rules about what can be taken into account and the reasons that government decisions can be made um, that uh, are in place under both federal and state law. And I think from there, particularly given that no one can see me at this point, <laughs> I, I will start to hand it over to questions um, and then I have more content that I can go over if, if we need to. And I, again, I apologize, I don't know what's going on with the camera here. So uh, we're familiar with uh, tech issues, uh, having dealt with uh, Zoom over the last three years of the pandemic, so we certainly understand, but uh, I'll use my prerogative as host to ask a couple of questions to start off with. But, um, you know, you mentioned group homes, and I remember the first time I dealt with uh, fair housing and group homes was 1991 was, uh, was legislative aid, uh, and then later when I was in the governor's office dealing with a group home uh, for the Department of Corrections on Park Drive. Um, but, but 
Berkeley doesn't face problems necessarily with group homes. We're more, you know, run into problems with fair housing and dealing with kind of town gown issues with, uh, you know, parts of the town um, being, um, you know, areas where college students from BU, you know, in some areas or BC and others or just, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of college students that we have uh, throughout the greater Boston area. So what are some of the problems that you've dealt with municipalities in fair housing and kind of the typical uh, conflicts that municipalities have with higher education, for example? And your camera looks that fantastic is suddenly at the cleared moment. Up. There <laughs> we go, with no reason. Right, so um, it is something that, that has come up. Um, there are cases in, in a number of towns and cities across the, the Commonwealth um, dealing with this issue. And so I, I think on the one hand, right, local government does have um, sort of significant authority to regulate occupancy of housing. Um, and it, one of the ways that, that we see uh, towns and cities try to do that is through definitions of family and who can live together uh, as a family in a single family uh, housing district, for example. And that's generally where this problem comes up. Um, and so there are ways, non-discriminatory ways that towns and cities can, can define uh, a family unit. Um, most of the um, better ordinances that we see and the ones that have been written more recently um, and a lot of the push in the direction of the law is towards are towards functional definitions. So rather than talking about relationships by blood and marriage and things like that, which we do still see a lot of definitions uh, on that, uh, we, we see definitions um, based on the, re, you know, the functional relationship between people and focusing on something that's called a housekeeping unit, which is that people that are living together and acting in a general sense, like a family acts, um, that those are the types of definitions that tend to run into less opposition and less difficulty under the fair housing laws uh, than definitions that are based on blood relationships uh, and marriage. Um, and there are, um, some fairly strict rules under the federal uh, constitution and under Massachusetts law of how restrictive that definition can go um, before it starts running into equal protection problems, which is just, are we treating people differently based on reasons that make sense? Or is the, the reason that we're treating them um, irrational or, or, or doesn't hold up in a way? And so again, I think that's where we start to see it where, um, you know, a definition based on a functional relationship, the way that people are living and relating to each other um, and acting like a family, as opposed to a definition that's based on sort of more immutable characteristics, blood relationships, marriage, and stuff like that. Those tend to run into fewer problems now. Excellent. Um, and you mentioned reasonable accommodations in, um, you know, um, and how it applies to fair housing. Can you give some examples in both the kind of zoning um you know context but also in permitting context too sure the so the the way that you know you mentioned that you don't see a lot of problems with group homes or or sober homes and things like that that tends to be where we we tend to tend to see it coming up and so a very easy example that came up recently is um if there's an occupancy restriction that says for example no more than five people who don't fall into a definition of family can live together in a in a house in a single family district um but you know you have a, a group home where let's say eight or ten people want to live together in congregate living and that provides therapeutic benefits for people there's a medical justification for it uh, there's a functional justification uh, a reasonable accommodation in that situation would be for the operator of uh, of the group home to ask for the town to make an exception to allow the, the group home to operate despite the fact that it's outside of the, the rules uh, under the, the zoning ordinance. Or, you know, if, if we're talking about a permitting decision, if someone's trying to build that, that group home in a single family area and it's a non-conforming use, then, you know, asking the town to make a, an exception and grant the necessary permits for it to operate 
uh, would be a, a reasonable accommodation. And that, that sort of type of thing around occupancy restrictions is where we, we see it a lot. Excellent. And uh, now let me start asking some questions um, that have been posed uh, from the participants. And one of them is, um, uh, could you cite some specific, you know, state and federal laws that you were enforcing? And, sure. uh, you know, and also kind of in that same uh, vein, since we're not all uh, lawyers and our, our uh, participants, um, you know, are there good resources that can uh, help lay people understand these Fair Housing Act um, issues? For example, EEOC has a great guidance on the ADA. You know, is there sure. something similar um, that you're aware of either you know, through your office or the feds? Where there's kind of layman's guides to fair housing. Sure. So on the federal and state side, you know, the primary laws are the Federal Fair Housing Act um, on the federal side. And under Massachusetts, it's the anti-discrimination law, which people also may know as chapter 151B. Um, so it's the same law that prohibits discrimination in employment. Uh, and housing um, and so on. Um, and again, the, the protections under Massachusetts state law are very similar to what they are under federal law, except that they, Massachusetts rules tend to be more protective from a civil rights perspective. Um, we also have, uh, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, provides protections based on disability. Um, there are particular protections for group homes and discrimination based on uh, disabilities in Massachusetts zoning law. Um, there are protections in the new MBTA Communities Act um, for families with children. Um, and then there are protections under both the federal and the state constitution um, that also that, that generally prohibit discrimination that also apply to, to housing decisions. So it's sort of that entire um, web of laws uh, that we're talking about when we when we talk about fair housing laws uh, with the Federal Fair Housing Act and the anti-discrimination law 151b sort of being the, the most prominent. Um, in terms of resources, so the Department of Justice and Housing and Urban Development sort of periodically put out guidance and advisories on how federal fair housing laws apply to local land use regulations. Uh, the most recent one I'm thinking of right now was in 2016. Um, I'm sure at this point it has been both rescinded and reinstated. Um, but there are there are similar ones, uh, you know, every four or eight years that provide sort of a general guidance on on um, how these rules apply. Um, and like I said, you know, it's not going to be the same in every situation between federal and state law. The rules are broadly the same, and if you have a you know a good understanding of the one, you know you'll have instincts on 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 the other as well. Okay, and then um, you know you mentioned the definition of kind of a house housekeeping unit as opposed to definitions based on uh, familial uh, status and relationship. Can you give uh, or maybe this is a question for Margaret? Um, you know. Um, you know, a, an example of municipalities that have good definitions that we can look to uh, for those housekeeping unit definitions. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but that's certainly something that we can follow up on and provide to Joe and for further distribution, wider distribution. Okay. And actually I have a question for Margaret. I didn't want to only pose the questions to John, but uh, John mentioned kind of, you know, the, the areas that he looks into with like dis, uh, disparate impact and, and district uh, discriminatory um, uh, effect and intent, sort of dis discrimination. But uh, can you speak a little bit to what your office does in its review as to bylaws that are facially valid or bylaws that might be uh, applied uh, in, a, in a, uh, a lawful manner. So kind of facial challenges or as applied challenges. Yes, so our review of bylaw text is just of the text in front of us. And if the words on their face um, are, don't pose a conflict with state law or federal law uh, or the constitution, then uh, the courts tell us that we must approve the bylaw. But 
we recognize that um, in many instances, the application of that bylaw text may um, run afoul, if not done properly, of various state laws or federal laws. And here um, on this topic, we, again, talk with John Burke, we, uh, he tells us that's fine, but, or, you know, um, you might wanna think about disapproving this word or something like that. If it's a, that, that's, that's okay on its face, but um, be careful how it's applied, then we include that in our decision. And we, that text that we often include in our decision where we comment on um, those kinds of potential troubling applications. And we, we always advise that the town consult with town council closely during the application of such a bylaw. And it's very important, I think, that that language um, you know, be kept in mind, not just put in a drawer somewhere. Um, we spend a lot of time drafting our decisions and where we say, you know, it's, we encourage the town to consult with town council about something, that's for the town's benefit so that the town doesn't get into a situation where they could be sued. Um, you know, Framingham learned that lesson many, many years ago when dealing with smock and they had to settle for millions of dollars after a lot of litigation. Um, there's, you know, potentially monetary uh, risk to the town and you have so many other things that you'd rather spend your money on, I am sure. Um, it's um, very cheap, short money to consult with town council um, and, and do things the, the careful and cautious way, especially on this type of topic. Um, so what I was um, going to suggest as well is that um, our decisions, even if it's not a Brookline decision, if it's, if it's a decision to another town on Fair Housing Act issues, you can find those decisions on our on the mass.gov website. If you just search under MLU decision lookup, and then that will bring you to a search page. You can do a full text search, just plug in the term Fair Housing Act, and that will bring up a list of decisions that you can access um, that will you know, give the basic um, cautions about application of a certain bylaw text in, in the context of Fair Housing Act requirements. So um, happy to share any you know, um, particular decisions. If you see anything that you have questions about, feel free um, to, to email me directly. And Joe, thank you very much for putting the, the, uh, the, web, the website search function there on the chat. Um, so that's how we work closely with John um, on these issues. Again, you know, we as an office would love, you know, to put John Burke and his division out of, out of business as well. You know, it would be great if there, if there was no need for any enforcement actions, if every municipality did things the, the right way. So we're, we're trying to assist, educate, provide resources to all municipalities. And we try to use our bylaw decisions um, to further that, that goal as well. Yeah, I, I mean, completely honestly, we would love if that were, were the case too. We completely share that goal. Um, and I, I think this is a good example of how the different divisions in the office work closely and cooperatively um, together. The, the fair housing review that MLU does is incredibly important. It catches a lot of things that are problematic. Um, but you know, where these warnings are coming from is, as Margaret said, we we're realizing that, you know, of the different types of discrimination I was talking about, uh, the grounds on which the courts have said MLU can disapprove a bylaw are one type of one type of discrimination, right? It's one type of disparate treatment discrimination where a, a bylaw is discriminatory on its face. Um, and those warnings and those flags that are in the decisions are really meant to be helpful for the towns and for other people that are interested in the issues to see where the office thinks that that bylaws could run into problems um, or where we may see a flag that needs to be investigated through civil rights, even if it gets, you know, it, um, uh, 
approved by, by MLU. Also, I never get to tell Margaret what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll work, I'll go on uh, to other questions from participants. And, and one of them was a question about, um, John, what issues do you have or run across when you're dealing with um, housing of formerly homeless? Sure, so we see a lot of overlap there again with disability. Um, uh, you know, we see, you know, where you're talking about, um, in a lot of cases, group homes or congregate living, SROs um, and things like that. Um, substance abuse issues, uh, you know, a lot of those come up in context of housing the formerly homeless or emergency housing. Um, and so that tends to be where we see a lot of the action uh, is opposition um, or, you know, application of rules uh, that um, involve uh, potentially problematic applications with uh, disability. Um, and so, you know, when I'm talking about substance abuse, so recovering from a substance abuse uh, problem is a disability under both federal and state law. Um, and so the same rules that prohibit discrimination based on any other physical or, or mental disability are going to prohibit discrimination based on, um, you know, some, you know, the fact that, that uh, a place is housing people who are recovering uh, from substance abuse disorders. Um, you know, less so here, honestly, than when I was in New York, uh, we do see overlap with sort of discriminatory assumptions about who's going to be living in housing uh, for recently homeless. Um, and so, you know, that those type of things, you know, we don't want those types of people here, broadly speaking, uh, also raise a lot of flags for us, um, because they can either be overtly or sort of um, implicitly expressing opposition to housing based on race, ethnicity, uh, and other characteristics. But again, we do seem to see less of that here um, than um, problems related to disability discrimination. Okay, and in a similar topic or a similar vein, uh, what issues do you, you see with the uh, uh, housing of formerly incarcerated? Um, You know, for example, you know, uh, yeah. it was in the 90s, uh, you know, I dealt with an issue uh, that people were protesting the governor's office because they discovered that the Department of Corrections operated a group home was really kind of, a, you know, the minimum security halfway house. Um, but people were surprised that it would be on Park Drive adjacent to the Fenway you know, near a school and, you know, near, uh, you know, universities. So, yeah. uh, you know, does... Uh, you know, neighborhood opposition to a Department of Corrections or sheriff's, uh, uh, you know, facility, uh, you know, implicate fair housing. Sure. So we see this come up in two ways. Uh, the the first is um, where we see towns and cities maybe stretching their land use regulations to try and restrict this type of housing, um, and um, although you know. Uh, formerly incarcerated is in a protected class under fair housing laws, there are uh, equal protection rules about, you know, and due process rules about how government needs to make decisions um, that are going to come into play if, if a town is trying or a city is trying to stretch zoning rules uh, too far. Um, you know, something that really is permitted under the town's bylaws. Um, but it's being, you know, those rules are either being in a applied in a way that, that they they either haven't been applied uh, when it comes to other forms of housing or which the, the text of the bylaw doesn't really support, um, that's a problem. It's not necessarily a very narrow fair housing problem in the sense that it doesn't probably violate the, the federal fair housing law or 151B because in order for, for there to be an issue there, again, it has to hit on you know, decisions based on a protected classification um, it is still, let's say, fair housing adjacent, um, and you know these other rules come into play. Uh, again, 
you know, we have had complaints, um, both related to housing for the formerly homeless, emergency shelter, um, halfway housing, you know, those types of things that, that do involve people who are um, leaving incarceration, uh, that, uh, you know, a town is making a decision or that there is public opposition uh, based on these sort of uh, discriminatory stereotypes about who is going to be living there. Um, and like I talked about, um, you know, if a town acquiesces to that type of opposition it, and makes decisions based on discriminatory public opposition, that's potentially a fair housing problem. Um, and, you know, if people are making statements in town meetings that indicate discriminatory opposition, that's potentially a problem as well. Okay. And then um, can you talk about any concerns or examples uh, involving accessory, accessory dwelling units, ADUs, and specifically if they're limited in some ways, like only own, owner-occupied areas? Sure, um, so maybe may, may this is the time to uh, include a description of one of my favorite uh, the terms, the Mrs. Murphy exemption. So. Yes. So there is what you're referring to is there's a very famous exception in federal fair housing laws um, for uh, sort of very small scale housing. So an owner occupied housing, um, some of the, the federal fair housing laws do not apply. Um, for the most part, those exceptions are not carried over into Massachusetts state law. Um, and so this is going to be one of the areas where Massachusetts state law is more protective um, than uh, federal law. And, you know, the background why this is called the Mrs. Murphy uh, exception is coming from someone who I think is similarly of Irish extraction. Uh, the idea is little old Mrs. Murphy who is living on the ground floor and doesn't want person X living in the apartment upstairs. That's the origin of the term. Um, and so that is, in fact, an exception under federal fair housing uh, laws, the Fair Housing Act. Uh, it is generally not applicable under state law. Um, so the, the problems that the towns, you know, have run into and some of the flags that that MLU has given, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, for accessory dwelling units, uh, again, get into trying to restrict who can live in those units, right? Um, so that's where we start to see problems. There are certainly acceptable ways that towns can restrict, uh, towns and cities can restrict uh, occupancy and accessory dwellings. Um, you know, the, where we see problems are where we see problems in other areas too. Uh, overly restrictive definition of family members um, that, that end up having, um, that either frankly just don't make sense, um, because there, are, uh, you know, there are exceptions that are in there for certain type, you know, certain, uh, types of occupancy and not others. And again, there are just general rules for government decision-making, uh, that they need to be reasonable to a certain level in order to pass muster, um, also that, you know, we, we do see a lot of, of the, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the most restrictive definitions of family that I can remember seeing in the last five or six years have been attached to accessory dwelling units, you know, not only trying to define family by blood relationship or marriage, but specifying particular categories of relatives that can live um, in accessory dwelling units. So grandmothers, sons, daughters, but not cousins, uncles, aunts, and we start to see fair housing problems uh, there. Does that seem like a fair summary, Margaret, sure. of what oh, we've Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, I, um, I would agree with that. I was just um, trying to see if there was anything additional helpful that I could, that I could add uh, regarding what we've seen. Um, I can certainly, I'll search our decisions and my information and send anything that might be helpful along to Joe for further distribution, but I would agree with John's answer generally. Yeah, and, I, and it, maybe I need to provide a more uh, sort of uh, 30,000 foot explanation for why these problems, why these definitions of family are, are problematic. 
Um, so it, it is, again, it is on the one hand, just these basic rules about reasoned government decision making. Um, and there's a very famous federal case dealing with um, housing restrictions in Cleveland um, that tried to specify which categories of relatives could live uh, in a single family home and which couldn't. Um, and the, the court's decision where there was this, essentially just this doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't pass muster to try and say that this category of relative can live here and this category of relative cannot. Um, that overlaps significantly with sort of more narrow fair housing concerns, which is that different racial and ethnic groups have different um, sort of customs about family living and things like that is the basis for this decision, which is from the 70s and 80s and is a little you know, outdated in some of the language that it uses. Um, the, the challengers there were, were a black family um, and the court's decision was that in some, in, you know, in some cases, uh, some groups have a, a, a um, customs of extended family living um, and the government has no business in trying to tell people that your grandmother can't live with you, but your, you know, your son and daughter can, or your, uh, your cousin can, but your uncle can't, um, because we, again, those distinctions don't necessarily make sense and don't hold up, and, and they do have these sort of fair housing overtones about having a disproportionate impact on one group of people uh, as opposed to another group of people. Um, and we've seen that issue come up actually quite intentionally recently in Massachusetts, um, where we see the racial or ethnic composition of a community change. Um, and then we see uh, you know, changes to, to rules about um, occupancy in single family districts um, that have concerned us because they appeared to be targeted towards uh, new residents who, who were living in, let's say, just say different ways than the prior residents had. Okay. And um, then, you know, how would you suggest we would respond to residents' concerns about the fiscal impact of, um, you know, due to multifamily and uh, multi-unit uh, um, housing? So, you know, the concerns people have about uh, infrastructure doesn't support new people or, you know, uh, you know, development will bring more kids to the schools. So, Sure. How would you suggest uh, you know our policymakers here in town respond to those residents' concerns? Sure. So there are obviously legitimate concerns that need to be taken into account. Um, but the ways you know there are rules about the ways that the town can take that into account. Um, some of which are narrow fair housing issues. Some of which are just more general. You know the more general government decision making uh, issues that we've talked about. Um, I think. Uh, courts in Massachusetts and our office have been giving increasing attention uh, to zoning bylaws um, that were motivated by a desire to deal with the fiscal impact of particular types of housing. Um, and I think we are moving towards a consensus that zoning decisions uh, that are intended to manage fiscal impact, where that impact is based on demand for essential public services like schooling and things like that is probably not a legitimate basis for a town to be making uh, uh, zoning decisions. And I think MLU has recently uh, disapproved of some zoning bylaws um, for, for some of those reasons. Is that right, Margaret? Yes, and permitting as well. Um, yeah, permitting. The, the court decisions have included uh, special permit um, decisions. So. so things like, you know, how do we continue to provide essential services for uh, residents? Um, you know, what impact is this going to have on schools? Those are obviously very legitimate and common concerns. Um, where we start to see problems is if the answer is, well, we're not going to build multifamily housing or we're not going to build this particular type of housing. Um, that 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 can be problematic where that's the solution to the problem. Um, and again, in a state where 
familial status is a protected characteristic and familial status includes both marriage and then also families with children. There is a very fine line between some of these legitimate concerns um, and concerns and types of opposition that trip over into fair housing problems. Um, you know, we have definitely seen permitting decisions and local land use regulations where we were concerned that the motivation was to try and exclude families with children, particularly families with young children. Um, and it's something that, that, that does raise flags in the office and something that we have looked into in the past. All right. So I'm down to my last uh, participant question. So uh, participant, uh, you know, uh, uh, participants, if you want to ask a question, this is your uh, last warning. But um, this question is about kind of that, you know, the um, economics is kind of correlated to protected statuses. So sometimes, uh, you know, things might not be um, overtly, uh, you know, uh, intentionally discriminatory, but could be, um, you know, indirectly through the use of, um, you know, theses that are not uh, explicitly protected class like economics. So how do you, how do you deal with that kind of disparate impact type of analysis when you're looking at something that a municipality might be doing? Um. Right. I mean, I think that's a fairly sophisticated question that, that kind of has the answer. In three minutes or less. It. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, not, 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 a, not a semester long answer. Yes. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's definitely a problem, right? And, you know, both the federal and state laws, this is the reason why that they protect um, against both intentional discrimination and then against disparate impact discrimination. And, and you know, on the one side, the justification is towns and cities frequently don't announce the discriminatory reasons uh, that are motivating their, their decision making. Um, and on the other hand, um, people are infinitely inventive in this area is actually a direct quote from one of our, our state cases. Um, and so we're concerned, particularly when we're talking about state law, um, about what that impact is, um, you know, if it, it doesn't matter if if the rule is neutral on its face, that's the entire sort of theme of disparate impact liability. Uh, it doesn't matter if the town intended to discriminate. Um, what we look at is what is the actual effect in the real world. Um, you know, there is a large amount of statistical analysis that goes into this, um, particularly in more recent years. Uh, there's a lot of analysis and what the justification is for the decision, right? Because just because something has a, a, an impact uh, that's different on one group of people than it is on another, you know, that's that's not a hundred percent guarantee that it's going to violate fair housing laws. You know, if the if the town or city has a legitimate justification for why it needs this type of rule, that sort of gets put on the the scale and and weighed in terms of is this a legitimate uh, land use regulation or not. Um, so, you know, in some sense, that's where most of the action is um, in land use regulation cases and in fair housing cases that involve zoning and permitting. Um, and I say that both because it, it comes up more frequently now um, and also because the, the disparate or the disparate treatment cases are sort of, they're straightforward in some sense, you know, where we, you know, if a, if a, if a law is, you know, treating people differently on its face, that's fairly easy. It's there for everyone to see. Um, if there's a record from town meeting or from, you know, board, board meetings that are recorded or, you know, somebody, you know, whether it's the town recording it or somebody recorded it on its cell phone, and we can see what people are saying about why they're making these decisions. Again, there's, there's not a lot of um, uncertainty there, you know, trying to figure out, okay, we have this rule that's neutral on its face. Um, or that's making distinctions based on economic considerations or other considerations that aren't protected classes, but we see this very real, dis, you know, disproportionate impact. 
Um, those are the more complicated cases and the ones that you know take up more of our time. So in our last couple of minutes, uh, a question that you get to ask yourself, what, uh, what uh, do you think uh, we haven't addressed that you think we should uh, hear from you in our last couple of minutes? I'll go with uh, John first, and then Margaret can close us out. So what are your final <laughs> thoughts you want to share, share with uh, Brooklyn that you think we should know? Um, so I'll, I'll say something that I think doesn't get get stressed a lot when when we give these trainings, which you know frequently come across as me lecturing people about what they shouldn't do. Um, you know, these are good rules in the sense that they they they're just and they're moral, but they also lead to better outcomes for towns and cities. They lead to better decision making. They lead to healthier communities. They lead to more prosperous and, and vibrant communities. Um, and so, you know, this is not just a you shouldn't do this or you can't do this. There is a flip side of it, which is you should do this because it has real benefits uh, that I don't think gets emphasized enough. You know, things like inclusionary zoning, those sort of things. Um, those have real affirmative benefits for towns and cities. Um, and, you know, we should probably spend more time talking about that. Okay, Margaret, you can close us out. Yes, um, and on a similar theme, um, we briefly just touched on the MBTA community zoning requirements. I know Brookline is um, in the thick of it um, and will be in the coming months. Um, I wanted to say, you know, we're here to help um, in any way we can with that uh, decision making process. But that too is an example where, um, you know, I know some other communities have been complaining about the requirements. The state is telling us what to do here, but it was the legislature who determined that this is a good thing for all um, MBTA communities to have, um, you know, to open up to multifamily housing. Um, and on a day when uh, one of the headlines was the median price for the Boston area housing units is now, or single family homes is now $900,000. It's, um, I think, just another reminder of how much we need, uh, we need to produce more housing units in, in the Commonwealth uh, writ large. But we're here to help. It's not just us saying you need to do this. We're 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 here to help uh, cities and towns comply and um, answer any questions and provide any resources that we can. Um, so I I really want to thank Joe as well for kind of planning this this evening and this opportunity for us to be here and answer questions and um, have this discussion. And happy to come back on a future one of these seminars if you like. Excellent. So first, I want to thank uh, Devin, who's in our background, and without uh, her assistance, none of this would be possible. But again, Margaret, John, thank you very much for taking time out of your uh, after work hours to share your expertise with Brookline. And I always love working uh, with my old colleagues, uh, my old office. So Margaret, uh, great to see you. John, nice to meet you. John joined the office after I left, and I promised him it wasn't because of his arrival. <laughs> there was other reasons why I left the AG's office, but uh, it was a motivating factor, but not. The yeah, heard you were coming, factor. heard your footsteps, <laughs> so got out of there quick. So, but uh, thank you, and thank you for all our participants who joined us this evening, and wish everybody a good night. Thank you.